So what have we got here? Well, we actually have two elements in their natural state. These are kind of special because you don't see these normally anywhere on the planet. Here's a piece of sodium, and here's another group one element from the periodic table, lithium. I'll show you what, where those positions are on the periodic table in just a moment. But here's two metals, and what happens actually when you cause a reaction with a little piece of lithium that I've chipped off of here, actually just using the scupula because lithium and sodium are very, very soft metals. Well, I can e actually create a chemical reaction here by just putting these metals, metals, into water. That's just water. And look at that lithium go reacting in that water. So how about a piece of sodium? Sodium goes into the water. The reaction is far more vigorous. Chemistry is the study of stuff. That's about it. But let's make it a fa fancy term then and call stuff matter. So chemistry is the study of, of matter, of all the material things in our universe. Now, there's lots of different ways to categorize or group this type of material, right? Uh, there are certain type of mixtures that uh, look pretty much the same all the way through. We call those homogeneous mixtures, but some of them, like if you put marbles into water, well, that's a mixture, but it's a heterogeneous mixture. You can still see the individual properties of the things that are involved in the mixture. Well, whether you got homo or heterogeneous types of mixtures, everything can be kind of turned into and broken down into substances. So we can actually take that divided into pure substances. Pure substances uh, can then further be broken down into, into the compounds and into the uh, ionic compounds or molecules that make up the substance. Okay, and then when we take these compounds or molecules and we break them down even further and we get to the essence where we arrive at a substance that cannot be by chemical or physical means broken down into simpler substances that really exist on their own. Now we're talking about elements. And elements, those are the things that make up this wonderful charting behind me here called the periodic table. Now, about 150 years ago, there wasn't really a scheme or a chart system in order to organize all of these elements, and it came to uh, two scientists of the time. Uh, one was named Lothar Meyer, he's a German, and Dmitry Mendeleev, a Russian, kind of working independently, but almost at the same time produced this that you see behind me, the periodic table, credited to Mendeleev for his fine work. Now, the periodic table is, well, it doesn't look like a very nice kind of table or chart. You'd think that maybe things could have been condensed and kind of squared off, but no, 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 no. This thing here it's so beautiful. It's brilliant in its, in its execution because what it does is that it, it organizes the elements, these things that can't be broken down by chemical or physical means into simpler substances that naturally occur. It organizes them in terms of increasing atomic number, and that's the number of protons in the nucleus. We'll get to that in just a second. And it also groups them in terms of similar characteristics or properties going down. That's how Mendeleev organized his table, in terms of similar chemical characteristics. So, we look at the periodic table and we start with the far left hand side. By the way, it's called periodic because there are trends that occur periodically going down. And also, remember that we read everything in terms of atomic numbers from left to right. And, you know, sentences we, we read here in North America from left to right and they end in a period. So remember, the periods go across and the groups go down. Now here's the first group on the periodic table. Some of them have common names. You've got to know them. Lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, and francium here in group 1A or group 1 of the periodic table. The hydrogen is included in there as well. Those are called the alkali metals. Now, what did you think of that little demonstration? Putting sodium and lithium into water causes an explosion. 
It's actually that the metals react with water and they break down into their ions in solution. We'll get to ions in a while too. Wasn't that absolutely fantastic that metals can actually be put into water and they disintegrate? Very interesting. You can't find any of these metals just naturally occurring on the earth. You can't go outside. You can't dig a hole in the ground and find sodium metal because it's already vigorously reacted either with the water in the ground or with other uh, elements like chlorine to form sodium chloride, which is table salt, right? So these right here, very difficult to extract unless you take some of these crystals that these elements are locked up in, heat them up, zap them with electricity, then you can isolate them too. So alkali metals here. Now this group right next door alkali earth metals. Now they react very similarly. They can react with water. Uh, not as vigorous, but they do. Alkali earth metals. Then you get a big hunk of the periodic table that kind of loses its height compared to the rest of it. And this chunk right here in the middle, that makes up your transition elements and really is just a bunch of metals that occur in this block of the periodic table. And we'll also call that the D block, but you have to look at the advanced uh, chemistry disk to be able to figure out what that means. It's a little bit of advanced talk there. So here we've got metals and then we have a staircase on the periodic table. And that staircase essentially separates things that are metallic, which means they have properties of being able to conduct electricity. They are ductile, which means you can bend them. And they're lustrous, which means that they're shiny. That's what constitutes a metal. Then this staircase separates those things that are metallic from things that are non-metallic. So non-lustrous, non-ductile, and then they, they also do not conduct an electrical current, except for some of the elements that occur just on the staircase because they kind of have properties of being both metallic and non-metallic because they kind of trans, they're, they're involved in a transition between metals and non-metals. So carbon is black, and, and, and so it's not shiny, and, and carbon is very brittle. You can break it so it doesn't bend, but it's a good conductor of electricity. See, it's got properties of metal and non-metal, so therefore it's called a metalloid. Those things that occur on the staircase, metalloids. And then you get your non-metals over here, which can generally be in either solid, liquid, or gaseous form at room temperature. Of course, the metals would be solid at room temperature, except for that one little tricky one, that's mercury down here, that's a liquid. And in these nonmetals, there's a couple of groups that we need to know the names of. Group 7 on the periodic table, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, astatine, those guys are called halogens. They have very similar chemical and physical properties, or halogens. And then the elements that don't like to react under normal conditions. They used to be called inert gases, but we can make them react. Inert means you just don't do anything. These guys here are called noble gases.